Showtime. Hey guys, welcome to the channel. Super glad to have you here. I am the editing board and with me is uh, my boss and friend, <laughs> Shannon Elaine. And uh, we are, uh, I, I, I'm excited at least to have her on the channel and be getting to introduce you guys. She works for uh, New Degree Press and going to be talking a little bit about publishing, getting some publishing tips from Shanda, and then also talking about a little bit of what New Degree does and kind of what sets them apart from some of the other publishers out there. Before we get into that, before we kind of get into the questions that I have for Shanda, um, Shanda, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit and uh, let everybody know who you are. All right. Well, I'm Shonda Elaine Spurlock, and I am the head of developmental editing for Creator Institute and New Degree Press. And you might not have heard of us yet, but we are a up and coming publisher. We've actually published several, actually several hundred already uh, books in a variety of genres, and that we're continuing that uh, to grow into that. And we'll be publishing many, many more over the next year and a half. Um, and we're looking at kind of long-term growth and stability within the publishing industry, which is a little bit different because a lot of publishers are talking about how hard it is and how difficult it can be to get published. And we kind of bring something very different to the whole publishing experience. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And so that's part of why I'm so so excited to be able to have the interview with you. Um, so, uh, welcome Dal and Ash to the chat. These guys are people who follow me around and listen to my rantings and ramblings. So super excited to have you guys here. Uh, before we dive in, just to kind of remind you guys, uh, there is going to be a Q and a session towards the end of the stream. So you guys will get to ask Shanda and myself about publishing, but probably more Shanda uh <laughs> about uh what new degree is publishing all that kind of stuff so i am super super happy about that hey shell welcome to the stream uh first question that i want to kind of go over and this is one that i hear a lot from authors is like what's the best way to publish your first novel uh <laughs> you know it, it's it's also very broad but that, that's kind of how the, the question is typically presented uh, when I'm asked, or I'm sure you've probably heard it too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and not to look overly stunned, but yeah, I hear that question a lot, actually. I actually hear that question from most every author I work with at some point in our publishing journey. And the truth is, how to publish your first novel is an, actually an incredibly personal choice. Mm. Now, whether you there's there's no real judgment in, in the same way that there was even 10 years ago as whether you're traditionally published versus self-published. Um, and in many ways today, the you're not locked out of things being self-published that you were locked out of 10 years ago. You can get a development deal being self-published now. You can get a movie deal being self-published now. You can get that Netflix TV show or that Netflix movie deal being self-published now in a way that even 10 years ago, you couldn't do. So really making that decision is very personal. Now, if you have a personal goal of being traditionally published, there's no reason you shouldn't strive for that. Now, I will be the first to say that not every first novel should be traditionally published. And what you may find yourself doing is self-publishing or hybrid publishing that first novel, building your kind of audience and all the people who are interested in reading the way you write, reading your voice, reading your stories. And then as you build into the second or third, possibly the fourth, then looking for traditional representation to jump into traditional publishing. But that comes back to whether or not that's even a personal goal for you. Several of the popular authors right now, including the author of The Martian, um, any of you who read Wool, Sand, any of those books, those were all self-published. Hmm. Those were all self-published books and a self-published book went on to star Matt Damon in the film. So there aren't the same blocks there used to be. So what is best for you depends on your situation, your level of writing skill and how much work you're willing to do. 
if you want to be traditionally published, you're going to have to do a lot more work before you get to the publisher than you would to self-publish at all. Because a lot of the things that the publishers are looking for now are they are looking for books that are very polished already, and they're still going to make you go through their editing process. So you're still going to have to find a proofreader. You're still going to have to go through beta readers. You're still going to have to go through that before you go to the traditional publisher, just like you would before you went out and put it on Amazon if you are serious about this. Now, I'm sure that we all know people who are like, I wrote an amazing first draft and my every word is sacred and they just <laughs> slam that thing on Amazon. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be looking for, unless it's spectacular, honestly, um, and this is very, very rare, I wouldn't start looking for your next movie deal or traditioning publishing deal next because of that. You're going to have to do the work either way. It's really a matter of what you think. Now, I see one of you says that my current situation says I have to do traditional. I don't think that that's true anymore. Um, a lot of people get caught up in the idea of something costing a lot or caught having to spend money on editing, having to spend money on a cover. You can think far more creatively about that. Have you considered an Indiegogo campaign to help you fund those publishing costs? Have you con considered a hybrid publisher, which is something that we'll talk about in more in depth a little later? Have you considered even trying the self-publishing and asking your proofreader, your copy editor, the person who contributes the cover to take a percentage of royalties on the back end instead of a fee up the front. People do agree to those uh, arrangements. So you're not locked into something particular because you might be in a particular financial situation. There's almost always a way to work around it. Um, now, like I said, if your goal is to be traditionally published, there's no reason not to try for it. But to be traditionally published in the current environment, you're almost always going to have to get an agent who can get your manuscript solicited or find a way to get you in under the wire. And that is going to be key because a lot of places now, especially your, your big ones, your penguins, um, I know Simon Schuster, they do not accept any unsolicited manuscripts under any circumstance at this point anymore. So if you don't have an agent that can get you in, um, it's going to be far more difficult. Uh, and that is something to keep in mind. But again, that comes back to if that's a goal, maybe consider publishing traditionally your third or fourth book after you've built the audience, because the more audience you have behind you, the more likely a traditional publisher is going to come to you or one of their editors is going to come to you and say, hey, you've got 100,000 people that are out there following your website and wanting to talk about, and you've got all these followers on Twitter, we'd like to publish your book, even if they haven't read it. So those are definitely things to, to keep in mind. It's, it's very, there's a lot of moving pieces, um, but there's a way forward for everybody who wants to publish a book and actually put the work into being an author. And that's really a big part of the key. Yeah, I, I love that. I think when, when I first started out as an author, my, my whole thought was, you know, well, I, I'll just go traditional publishing. And then the more I learned about traditional publishing, the more I was like, well, I'll just do self-publishing. And then I realized that I'm broke and <laughs> I, can't, I don't necessarily have the children, fun. people and, and things to yeah, feed. Kids, they like to eat. They're like, we're so hungry. I'm like, well, <laughs> no, daddy's got to pay for the book cover, you know? <laughs> uh, but it, it's, it's one of those things where it, in many cases, it seems like, authors are caught up in like a damned if I do damned if I don't uh because like well I can go with traditional publishing but I'll also lose like you know x amount of percentage of the royalties like on yeah yeah <laughs> you know it's just like I haven't poured my blood sweat and the tears into it for nothing <laughs> and while there is you know some benefits to doing going a traditional route the other hand is you also have to work your back off when you self-publish because you have to do the all of the work and you know a lot the authors they get overwhelmed you know that's why that's why you hear you know that question what's the best way to do it because they're like i have no idea <laughs> i hear horror stories coming at me from all directions 
Well, and that's just it. And the thing is to not to listen to, it's good to be aware of someone else's horror story, but it, not to yeah. give into it because their horror story can be your, oh, so this is actually a lesson to live by. You created X, Y, Z out of your horror story because you didn't have it edited. You didn't have it proofread and you let your aunt Mabel put the cover together and she can only see out of one eye sometimes. <laughs> okay. That's their horror story. And you can look at that and go, Okay, so my aunt that's really good at proofreading, but isn't a proofreader, probably isn't the right choice. I need to go out and find someone. And you can actually go out on Upwork or Fiverr or um, Readsy, especially, and you can find people who are really hungry to do the work and for the first chance, and will do a pretty decent job for you for a reasonable fee. Now, once you get more established, you're going to want to work with people who are more established um, because honestly, part of your reputation will be the reputation of the people that you work with. And that's just, that's just a sad fact of, of the way it is that yeah. you are buying a little bit of legitimacy, um, leaning on the legitimacy of others. So yeah, now I, do, absolutely. I do see a question about uh, what would you say to a blind writer whose punctuation is questionable? Um, what do we do? How would a traditional publisher work with a blind writer? Um, in most cases, a traditional publisher uh, would do kind of the same thing that a hybrid publisher might do. Um, in, and that the first thing that we would do is probably suggest you do something called scribe writing. And scribe writing is where you log into a uh, program like Otter AI or Timmy AI and actually speak your book out and then shovel that off to a proofreader to help you fix the question, the punctuation from questionable to actually getting it back to where you, where it should be. And part of that editing process for you would actually be going back and forth with those manuscripts. Um, and what they would do is that when it came back to you, you could of course use, whether you have Apple or Microsoft, there's an accessibility reader and you can have the reader read the manuscript back to you to make sure that it sounds right to what you were actually trying to say. And that that punctuation adjustments that your proofreader has made have not actually changed the meaning of what you were trying to convey. Um, and so that's where you would start. Um, and there would be, I, I won't, I'll be honest, there'd be quite a bit more back and forth um, because you won't be working necessarily in the same way. But publishers, whether they're traditional or hybrid, can work with that situation. That's not actually, believe it or not, that's actually not that difficult, especially with a lot of the accessibility options that you have now. You don't have to hire a reader to read your manuscript back to you. You can actually choose any number of voices. I was actually messing with mine today and mine now speaks back to me in a really horrible Irish accent that makes me laugh every time it says something. <laughs> it sounds like an elf that fell off a box of Lucky Charms, uh, which always brings me a little bit of joy. And when it annoys me, I'll change it to another one. Uh, and you can do the same thing to read those transcripts back to you. Um, and then, you know, change, make any changes you need to in the scribe, send it back, and you would work back and forth that way. That's awesome. All right. Well, since we're on on the roll there, let's uh, do baby pandas. And welcome, yeah. baby pandas. <laughs> yes. If traditional publishing still requires you to edit everything yourself and to gain an audience, what benefit do they offer? What benefit they offer is marketing. If you are really looking for that movie deal, if you're really looking for that TV deal, if you want to be on the New York Times bestseller list, it's going to be incredibly difficult to do that without the marketing power of somebody like Penguin, without Random House, without Simon & Schuster, because they have worldwide distribution. They will also handle all of your translations, all of the new covers for every country that you're going to be published in. There's so much that they do that even a hybrid publisher isn't going to be able to help you with. That marketing power and the insights that they have, um, I actually, I actually know an author that got in um, as part of Ace. Ace is now owned by Penguin. Um, some of you might remember the old Ace tour. That's all Penguin imprints now. And uh, so, yeah. So with those imprints, you have to have the agent. You have to have the work. But once you're in, they do put a lot of money and time and effort behind getting you on bestseller lists, 
getting you in front of the right bookstagrammers, getting you in front of the right blogs, in front of the right interviews. If you want to be on Good Morning America in six months with your book, that's what your traditional publisher is going to be able to do. That's going to be very difficult for an agent that's working with a self-published book to pull off the same thing unless you have an award winner. Now, uh, Stephen and I are very fortunate to work with someone who has been nominated for the Shirley Jackson Horror Award and has been nominated for an Edgar Award um, and is self-published. But again, all of his stuff gets slid under the wire by his agent almost directly into TV and film. So he's not even trying to be a best-selling book author. The books and stories are to get him the awards, to get him the notice, to get him into film. That's what that's about. So it's really about what your end game is. But with a traditional publisher, if you want to go worldwide and have that taken care of by people who know what they're going to do and are going to make it a hit, that's where you're going to want to be. Yeah. And that's a, that's a great kind of uh, lead in question for the second one that I usually see come up, which is, you know, self publish versus trade publish versus vanity versus hybrid, which I don't think very many people are aware of the hybrid option, but they usually hear trade self or vanity and vanity is, are they're the leeches of <laughs> <laughs> the publishing industry in many cases. Kind of. And and I'm probably going to be a rare, especially a rare developmental editor or somebody who works with a lot of editors that's going to say there is actually a place for a vanity publisher. There really is. And, but it's such a small place and there's so many vanity publishers that that's where the problem is. We need right. five or six vanity publishers, not 5,000. Right. <laughs> yeah. Everybody who has a printer does not need to be a vanity press. So let's talk about that a little bit. We've talked a lot about traditional already. Yeah. So let's look a little bit at hybrid and then we'll talk about a true place for vanity. Now with hybrid, especially a hybrid publisher like Creator Institute with New Degree Press, um, what's different about us is that you come into the program and first of all, it's taught like a class. So there is an actual curriculum. We actually take you through how to write your book and put you on a timeline for getting it done. Now, you are still required to do the work, but you're working with a developmental editor from about day about day 15. Yes, a guy like that right there. <laughs> um, from about day 15 of the class. So you'll have three class sessions and then you would start working with your developmental editor from the first story you write. So if someone is with you from the ground all the way through when you submit your first rough draft manuscript. Then you have another editor, an acquiring editor, who goes through that manuscript, gives you additional feedback, does some additional revisions to show you how, what direction you should take things. And then once you've worked with your acquiring editor for four weeks, you then move on to work with your marketing and revision editor. Your marketing and revision editor, at least what we do at Creator Institute New Degree Press, is that we have another editor whose sole job is to help you work through all of your revisions so you have a publishable manuscript and then take all of the little nuggets and all the things that you need to build a marketing campaign for you. Because with what we do as a hybrid is no, we don't pay you in advance, but we teach you how to run your own Indiegogo campaign, how to do your marketing. You have a marketing editor working with you on getting through your marketing and so that you can actually pre-sell enough of your books to pay for the publishing entirely. And then after that, anything you make, you make. You retain your copyright. You retain your publishing rights. None of that actually goes to us. Our goal is to teach you how to write a book so you can do it again without us. That's the goal. But yeah. by the time you do that with us, you have a professional cover, a professionally edited, proofread, copy edited, developmentally edited, acquiring edited. You've been through a whole publishing cycle. So regardless of whether you want to self-publish or you want to traditionally publish your second book, you know how. You know what's coming up and you know how to work with people. And you've had a very low economic layout but you're still required to do the work, but in exchange for that work, you get the help that you need. Building your campaign, 
finding out how do I write a Medium article? Where do I post all this stuff? How, what platforms are best for me? Do I need to be on Goodreads or do I need to be on Twitter with my book? Do I neither? Do I need a Tumblr account? Who does that anymore? Who even has Tumblr anymore? <laughs> and you have someone whose specialty is marketing your type of book to help you do that. And that's what we offer is a hybrid publisher. So that's very different because we're not paying you to come to us and you'll pay a few nominal fees to get started, but you're not paying for the whole publishing process. You can actually come out of it at zero if you work on your book like you should and you work your campaign the way you should. Well, and that's one of the things that I... I was so excited about and the, the more that I, you know, have gotten the chance to work with you guys and talk with you guys and and watch the students that I've worked with go through the publishing process. Like I have I've had uh, two that I, I know of because I've, I've snooped. <laughs> yeah. uh, but and uh, I'm working with uh, them to do like an author interview very similar to this to try and help them out with their books because I've just been so excited for them. Uh, but it, it's been fun to kind of watch from the sidelines, them go through this entire process from start to finish and see the published book. And I mean, I vote, I was a part of their beta groups and voted on the covers cause I was very invested, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, to, to see the covers that came out of it and to see just how excited they were to learn how to do that. And that's one of the things that I appreciate is that it's not just a publish and done. These are lifelong skills that they're going to be able to take with them into whatever future book that they write. And they have a much better grasp of how to do that versus stumbling their way through trying to self publish and spending thousands of dollars that they didn't need to in kind of just chasing the mm -hmm. wind in some cases you know, to try and find that magic thing that worked, you know, and you guys show them how to do it. Well, and that's just it. And I know a lot of people worry about advanced costs and things like that. And the truth is, if you run your, like I said, if you run your campaign, well, you, you can come out of it ahead, far yeah. ahead. Yeah, because there are, you know, there, there's, of course, there's different tiers, but you, you know, you want to work through your ebook. Great. There's a tier for that. You want to run your campaign and get the, all the way you want to provide everybody with hard covers. Great. There's a tier for that. You just, it's working the campaign, not how much money can you pony up right now. Yeah. Right. We're not, we're going to say, you know, oh, well, if you want this great actor to do your audio book, it's going to cost you 10 grand. No. You want this great act actor to do your audio book. Here's how much we have to do in pre-sale. And then when you see what it is in pre-sale, you're like, that's actually really reasonable. You'd be surprised yeah. what pre-selling a hundred books can get you on the back end. Yeah. As far as, and not just that, but you pre-sell. And so people go out and they talk about you on LinkedIn without you actually having to go behind them and go, can you please talk about me on LinkedIn? Can you <laughs> Facebook me. Can you please Insta my book? People will do it for you because they're excited about being part of the process and it's yeah. teaching people how you can do that. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's part of what we do now. I don't want to drag all vanity publishers, most of them, but not all of them because like <laughs> right. I said, there is actually a place for some of these books and some of the most beautiful family albums I've ever seen have come out of vanity presses. And that is where a vanity press can really shine because especially when you're trying to capture someone's memories or you're trying to capture a particular event that's for you and for your family, that is a great place for a vanity publisher where you would just step in and pay for the service that you need. Hmm. You know, if you want a book of your wedding and you want it to be a hard coffee table book that's laying there you don't need to put that on Amazon because probably it's a little creepy if strangers start buying your wedding album. It's a little creepy. Um, you don't want that, you know, um, but you want this hardcover, you know, kind of coffee table book. Um, pub vanity publishers can be really great at that because you're going to buy a very limited number of copies, maybe only one. It's going to be a lot of photographs. It's going to be very little, you know, very little written material 
those types of things. I've seen it done with um, with celebration books. We actually have a vanity press uh, here where I live in Texas. And um, that's actually what they specialize in. We have a lot of Catholic families and they do the life celebration books for funerals. So they're turning them around very, very quickly hmm. on demand. But they're doing these kind of signature books um, for the funerals that have photographs from the person's life and, and things like that. So there can be a, a, a valid reason to go to a vanity press, but I would almost always recommend it for something that's going to be deeply personal and that you want, honestly, you're going to want 20 or copies or less of. So it's going to be something that you're going to want just for your family, just as a gift, just as a one-time thing. You know, if you have all of grandma's diaries and you only want to give this to your mom as a hardcover book and not publish it, I would go to a vanity press in that case because that's going to be a lot easier for you than uploading, getting the PDF, having it proofread, getting it out on Amazon, printing it off, finding out who this 36 weirdos who downloaded on Kindle Unlimited for no reason whatsoever, <laughs> hunting them down. It, just, it's just going to be, there is a place for them. There's just not a place for all of them. The things right. you want to avoid with a vanity press or anybody that comes to you and says, I will publish your book for $3,000 and I'm going to retain the rights for four years to help offset the additional costs. Um, no, no, absolutely not. There's with a fiction book, with something that you want to do wider, you should never be paying someone to publish. You should never be paying someone to publish. And that's absolutely true. Yeah. No, I, I like that. I, I don't think I'd ever, uh, seen vanity presses in that light before because typically when people talk about the vanity presses that they get scammed by it's usually they're trying to publish their first book and the vanity publisher is like yeah for three thousand dollars you get all of this a unicorn and the leprechauns that you know <laughs> live in the backyard you're gonna be hit in ireland like random crap <laughs> yeah totally yeah. Random and, crap. yeah and they're and you know the people they're like i spent you know, I saw somebody in one of the Facebook groups, they were like, I spent $8,000 to have it published and the editing was garbage. And, and then like the vanity press disappeared, just, just straight up disappeared off of the face of the earth. And I was just like, oh, yeah. And that's where you, that's where you don't want to go to a vanity press. Honestly, if you have a fiction book, if you have, you, you or nonfiction. Honestly, if you're looking to, pr to print a true crime novel, it should not go through a vanity press for any reason. Um, now, depending on the nature of that novel, um, whether if you're writing something like Bloody Williamson, which was actually out of uh, Southern Illinois University Press, because it was about the county the university is in, mm -hmm. that's one thing. You'd want to look at a university press or something smaller and regional, but not, not a vanity press. Um, even the local authors I know here, um, especially after especially after working with me, they don't vanity press it anymore. They go ahead and they publish through Amazon and then order the copies they need through KDP um, and stock the local areas. Because anybody, anytime they're out selling, they can now tell somebody, you can get this on Kindle Unlimited. If you've got Kindle Unlimited, you can get this on your Kindle. You can download this on Amazon. You can buy this wherever, you know, so if you don't want to take it back on the plane when we were all doing that, we'll do that again soon. But if you don't want to take it back on the plane or you don't want to carry it around in the car, you don't want to carry it around today, here's my card. You can buy it from here. Um, and that's been valuable to them. It's also cut out those vanity presses that we all saw popping up around small towns. It was like, I print the local history books with all the errors they came to me with. Or <laughs> new ones that I made for you, special custom errors for for your for your book, yeah. um, and those are the ones you definitely want to avoid. But for those very special family projects, they are almost a little better because you have full control. And then whatever they tell you, the fee is you pay the fee, you get your book, and then you're done. They don't own anything. You've got your book for yourself or for grandma or for whatever you wanted it for. Um, so there, there is a, a good way to use a vanity press, but not for your fiction, not for your nonfiction serious book, not for basically anything that you sat down as an author to write, regardless of the genre, 
that does not need to go to a vanity press. Uh, and there are several, especially I've noticed creeping up here recently in the more esoteric arts. So if mm -hmm. you are, well, seriously, if you are a, a, a magician or Wiccan or practice any kind of spirituality that is outside the mainstream, I've seen a lot of vanity presses here in the last two years pop up around these genres specifically, and they are really, do please avoid them. Um, and go to your more traditional, even if you have to go to Llewellyn, go to, to a tr more traditional uh, press or publish on your own. Yeah, yeah, good advice. Um, all right, so we'll, uh, so guys, now is a great time when, if you have questions, um, and, and really it's, it's, it's open questions. Um, I want to touch on some of the ones that popped up in the comments and then, uh, I do have a, another additional question to uh, for Shinda. Uh, let's see. So comments. Uh, do, do, do. So Dal, I would uh, I would do all the work I can. I simply I'm <laughs> yeah, broke. Yeah, with the worldwide health situation, it's gotten worse for me. I I feel that Dal. Like I'm I'm with you there. <laughs> um, and then to follow that up, but that's why I'm seeking traditional because I can't pay a penny in advance. So for because uh, you had mentioned uh, the nominal fee for uh, mm -hmm. what is and that's uh, I know that I I know for a fact it's less than what you would pay for <laughs> to self publish a book. But what does that typically look like for an author? Uh, typically for an author, you're going to be looking at three to five hundred dollars. Typically, depend on manuscript uh, size. Pardon? Does that depend on like the manuscript size? No, actually, it depends on it's lower for a student than oh, okay. if you're a professional working in adult. So if you're in in college, whether you're in an MBA program or you're you're enrolled and you're not sure what you are, if you're undeclared, if you're undecided, we don't care. We don't care. We don't care about your major. If you're enrolled, the fee is significantly lower than if you're a professional, what we call professional working adult. So yeah, I don't want to commit anybody to a hard fee, but it's definitely, it's definitely not, we are not looking to break authors. We're looking to teach authors. And so we're not actually trying to like, give us, no, like turn you upside down and shake all the change out of your pockets. <laughs> um, so our fees tend to be, so for that, especially our uh, editing fee, our editing fee is far lower than you would have, um, if you go out and hire an editor, uh, like I know that, that <laughs> like so, you, like me, um, I, I, you know, I, my fees are actually quite high. So, you know, it's, it's definitely the whole idea behind it, like I said, is to teach authors and to kind of create a generation of authors and to give people their creation events, which is really what it is. If you want to be a public speaker, we're going to help you write the book that's behind that. If you want to have a podcast and, but I want to write this book. Well, then we're going to help you write that book and produce the podcast. So it's not singular. You're not going to get one thing out of it. If you want to get, you know, everything out of it, then you can get everything out of it. It's really up to how much work you want to do. Yeah. Um, and on top of that, um, we do some other things. Um, to to kind of help you along um we keep how do you keep the price so low um part of it is um by the number of people we work with that that is part of it and part of it is just our choice you know we are a startup and we made the choice that we want to work with as many authors as possible so when you look at some of the other hybrid publishers such as scribe even forbes has a business hybrid wing um university of iowa has actually started a hybrid wing uh, but you have to pay $12,000 to join their uh, certificate program. <laughs> That'll wake you up. <laughs> um, I think with Scribe, it's it's ten or $12,000, something like that. Um, part of it was that we're based out of, there's a lot of us that are involved either with universities or um, attached to schooling or education in some way. And the education part of it is far more important than how much money can we wring out of people because that's not our goal. Our goal is the creation event and helping people kind of have the life that they want to through their creation events. And our chosen creation event, what I focus on are books because I'm an editor and 
if I'm not talking about books, I'm reading books. And if I'm not reading books, I'm just sad. So <laughs> it's just sad all the way around. <laughs> yeah. uh, Baby Pandas had one. If I were to publish with you, would I need to do my own marketing? Uh, do I need a platform? You do not need a platform when you start. Um, you would do some of your own marketing, but that's what your marketing editor there is to help you know how to do that. When They tell you when to do it, where to do it, what to drop then. Okay, right now we need you, you know, here's what you need to do this week. You need to do X number of Facebook posts. Here are your quotes from your book that you should drop. These are your marketing bites. These are the things that we want you to focus on. Here's what I want you to do this week. You need to do three medium articles for me this week. Here's how you do it. Here's what subjects we're going to talk about. Here's when you should publish them. Someone helps you learn how to do all of those things. So you don't have to come with a platform. We'll teach you how to build a platform. It's yeah. really about, we, we're really about teaching you how to do things. Now, just like school, if you're not into doing your schoolwork, this isn't going to work for you, but it's not going to work for you at any hybrid publisher because you're going to, it's just like school, you got to do the work. If you want, you want the good grade and the, the recess and to hang out with all your buddies and talk about being authors, you got to write a book. So you got to do the work but the work is never so overwhelming that it can't be done while you're working, while you're raising a family, while you're doing other things. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. It's really I mean, there's uh, students that I've had in the past. So you guys, I've mentioned it um, previously. So like I freelance with NDP and I've been through the process of doing the developmental edits with students and I'm in the, uh, the current cohort doing that same thing and it is fascinating to watch because i mean with some of the students i mean i i have a student she's been sick like the entire time like the poor thing got hit with the flu back to back and you know there's still we can still implement a plan to be able to help her meet those goals but the the stuff that they're teaching them like i've learned a ton like before i started uh, freelance with you guys. I had no idea how to do uh, nonfiction. And then like every student I had <laughs> was nonfiction. And I was just like, oh my gosh, from tech literacy to drones, to grief, to gratitude. I mean, it was like, it was a widespread. Mm -hmm. And to see that process kind of step by step through that uh, in watching the students learn how to do their books and then you know watching the students from that first cohort you know now they've published their books and you know they've gone through the entire thing and one of them i know was in college um most of the other ones worked for like it companies they were running their own businesses and they had i mean they were still able to do it like it wasn't so overwhelming. I mean, emotionally it was, but like, <laughs> I was like, oh. you know, but that's what the DE is there for. And, right. and that, that's the thing about us as hybrid and something that we do that's very different is that you're working from somebody from the time you start working your first story. So every time you have one of those <laughs> author moments, you have somebody, you have somebody in the chat room, you can call them, you can book an appointment with them, you can check it, just send them a private message and be like, I'm having a heart attack. What do I do about that? They'll Definitely probably not. tell you to call 911 if you're not more specific, but they're there to help you through those moments. And that's part of why we do that is because we want our students to succeed. It doesn't do us any good to, you know, you, know, you pay the editing fee and then nothing happens that doesn't do anybody any good. You didn't have right. your, you didn't write your book. Uh, the DE didn't get to work with you. Nobody's having a good time. The truth is the DEs are doing this because we love doing this. This is what we love doing. Yeah. And we're looking for people who want to work with a publisher like that, that want to come in and actually work with somebody who's there to help you write the best book possible from day one, not just tell you that this isn't what we're looking for. So sorry. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's super discouraging for a lot of people when they send it out and they're like, oh, not for me. They're like, okay, you know, can I get any more information on maybe why? 
Yeah, well, and nothing's worse than when you're querying agents and you get the we don't know if your preferred term for your preferred wind of displeasure is sucks or blows, but this does. <laughs> and that's all they tell you. Right. <laughs> so sorry. Try again. What? That doesn't yeah. that doesn't help. And you haven't even gotten to the publisher yet. You're trying to get the agent to get you to the publisher. Yeah. Um, we want people to walk out with their first published book with a professionally designed cover, completely proofread, ready to go. When your mom sees it, she's not like, there are seven comma spices in the first paragraph when that's just terrible. I can't believe you're embarrassing me like this. And <laughs> you don't want that. Your mom doesn't want that. We don't want that. And so that's what we do. Yeah. Um, I see the question from Linda. Um, so New Degree Press does not publish books, but helps writers self-publish, right? We do publish a book. And that's just it, is that's why it's a hybrid. You retain your rights. We help you get that first wave, right? We show you how to run the campaign. We publish the book. We handle getting you six different professional covers to choose from. We handle layout. We handle formatting. We handle getting it on KDP. And actually, we don't just do KDP. Um we have ways of getting it out. We can get it on a nook. We can get it out wherever you're trying to get your book out. We can get it there for you. So we help you with all that. If you were self-publishing, you would be responsible for doing all that on your own. Yeah. Yeah. And I can, I can attest to, again, like the uh, two of the students that I had the very first time around, uh, I went and I, I pre-ordered the books. <laughs> I was like, yeah, shut up and take my money. Um, and it wasn't even published yet. It was just because I had worked on it. Mm -hmm. And then I got to be a part of the beta groups. And I've seen the covers that came through. And they were phenomenal. I was yeah. like, these are great. Like, you know, it some of cover designers do actually work for the big five. So you're seeing really, we're not messing around. It's not someone's amp flow out there with a crayon going, I saw this in the cavern book and it's great. And, it's and Bertha book. is not a part of the equation. <laughs> no, exactly. And, you know, or we have this family photograph that looks just like the character you described. You're like, that's Uncle Fred. And you're like, isn't he lovely? <laughs> On the front of your book. That's not what's happening in here. We have, we do have some of the same uh, cover designers that are working in the traditionals and working for uh, the big five as freelancers working with New Degree Press as well to develop those covers. And so you can definitely go out to Amazon and look up New Degree Press and just look at the quality of the cover versus yeah. what you would consider self-published and you will see a oh, yeah. radical difference. Yeah. So. And guys, uh, I don't think I had mentioned it yet, but I actually have the link down to New Degrees' website, New Degrees website. Uh, down below in the show notes. So if you guys want to see, because a lot of their covers are on their website, if you want to actually see some of the covers that they put out, I mean, they're good. <laughs> yeah, they're they're very good. They're they're not the standard like I did it on Canva <laughs> type of covers. Yeah, or or what is it, Bookbub or um, uh, Paint, Microsoft Paint, Pixma. Uh, yeah, there's some there's some terrible cover makers out there, that especially really because are. it's an app you can do on your phone for free. Don't, mm -mm. don't do that. No. Yeah. Um, the other thing, actually, in speaking about covers, something that does seem to confuse some self-published authors um, is how important a cover is. Mm, yeah. There are a few key notes that I'm just going to share with everybody. Uh, I know that, Stephen, you've, you've heard this before, but um, so here's the deal. If your cover is neon orange, neon yellow, or neon green, the book better be about Florida or LA. If it isn't, people get confused and the book doesn't sell well. There is a very real correlation between the color, the, the overall cover color, and what the content is. If it confuses the reader, they won't buy it. So yep. I, and I had a friend make this mistake, even though I stand there going, don't do it. I'm a professional. He's like, but I like bright orange. Yes, but your book is set in Texas, unless it's about unless it's about A and M or or the Aggies. Like, unless Bevo is on the cover, this isn't going to work. Bevo oh, was not on the cover. It's a western. It looks like it should be about Miami drug lords. He's got the whole comic book sans font. It's all oh. 
looking at the cover tells you it's one thing, reading the back tells you it's something else. It confuses readers, don't do it. Oh. So when you, when you make your cover choices, really do be careful to stay away from cover mills. Cover mills do produce really good looking covers, but you will walk through Barnes and Noble and I have done this when we could do this and I'm sure I'll get to do it again here later in the year, but you could walk through Barnes and Noble and find the exact same cover on four or five different books because they bought it from a cover mill. They just changed the title and maybe the color scheme a little bit. Don't do that. That will confuse readers as well. And when they're standing there looking at the rack and they see four books that look exactly the same, there's no reason they're going to pick up your book because by the time they've gotten there and gotten confused, they've forgotten which book they went there for. Yeah. So be really careful when using cover mills, Pixma, any place that says R, was it um, RFD123, um, anybody that offers you free stock photos, those are already going to be all over books that you're already seeing. Yeah. Uh, so Baby Panda had a had a good question. So what does it mean that I keep my rights? Literally, you keep your rights. And actually, a guy that teaches one of the greatest lessons about this in the funniest way is if you have a chance to go out to Audible or to go out to Amazon, pick up a book by Bruce Campbell. Yes, Ash from the Evil Dead wrote a book. It's amazing. And it's called If Chins Could Kill. It's a great book. That but he actually funny. talks about being an independent anything, being an independent movie maker, being an independent author, and how retaining your rights is important to how you make money in the future. If we as a publisher kept your rights for two years, that's two years in which we would control all the royalties from your book. So if we decided that we were keeping 90% and giving you 10 for two years, you wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Then once the rights reverted to you, you would then receive 100% of your royalties. What we say is we help you through and we get you published and we publish you and get you out there, but you retain the rights, which means after you finish the publishing cycle with us, you get your royalties very quickly. Once you've done the pre-sale, once you've done the publishing cycle with us, everything that you push after that is yours. So that is that is something that you definitely want to think about when you're when you're writing and doing your work. Who's going to own the rights to your book in the future? If you're Stephen King, who cares? You've written 600 books. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. You get a movie deal by going, I have an idea. And people from studios line up and hand you million dollar checks. That's great for Stephen King. But for the rest of us, you need to think about that a little bit more before you jump in when a publisher says, well, we're going to retain your rights for X amount of time. And the reason I bring up Bruce Campbell is that most of you who listen to audio, uh, Audible, or who see a traditionally published book, you'll see it says rights owned by Harcourt Brace Johnovich. You'll see rights owned, especially in Audible, Hachette Audio Media, Hachette Audio Media, Hachette Audio Media. You get to the end of Bruce Campbell's book, it says all rights owned by Bruce Campbell and Bruce Campbell Entertainment Incorporated. Not Hachette, not anybody else. And he did use a traditional publisher and still managed to retain the rights to his book. So it can be done. And one of the things, like I said, he's very funny about it, but all the stories he's telling kind of leads you into this is why you do it on your own if you want to live like this. Yeah. So it's definitely something to look into. And he's incredibly funny. So it's a great ride anyway. Yeah, it's so, true. It's Bruce Campbell. I mean. <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot lose. And I was I was just really surprised about all the little lessons that he snuck in without teaching a lesson. He never yeah. says the lesson from my story or here are the lessons. It's just listening to it and going, oh, that's how they made all these films without a massive studio or when they used a studio, why none of them live in Hollywood or why this is why this works for them. This is how they made it work. This is how long it took to make it work. And I think those are valuable lessons as well. Uh, but the big lesson I took from it was this is, he published a major publisher and that was the deal. He kept everything. And that is really unusual. Um, but when, and that's what we do though, is that we, you know, with NDP and, and Creator Institute, you keep your rights at the end of the publishing cycle. We don't. So that's yeah. definitely something too. Yeah, most, most definitely. Uh, Don, hey Don, welcome back. Uh, came in a bit late. Uh, did I hear this was only for college students? No, it's for anybody. Our age range right now is actually, we have students ranging in age from 14 
to 80. 14. Mm -hmm. We do. We do have at least one high school student, a cycle, publish a book. Wow. Um, cool. And believe it or not, and before everybody jumps in and says, is it poetry? Actually, no, um, it's yeah. not. That's it's not, it's not poetry. actually. Um, we've actually had, we had one write a horror novel. We had one write a fiction novel, just a fiction novel. Um, and um, we have one right now that has, she's from a family that has a number of unusual illnesses. And she's writing about her experiences being the only healthy person in this family. Wow. And what that's like at 14 and what that's been like to get to 14 and not realizing, you know, like all of us, right. You, you grow up not knowing that um, your family's weird until you go to someone else's house. You're like, we're weirdos. We're such weirdos. These are such nice, normal people. And, yeah. and what that reflects like though, when she goes to other places where everybody's healthy, hmm quote unquote normal. And then she goes home and nobody is, she's the only one. So it's a very kind of backwards perspective, but really interesting. But we have at least one high school student a cycle and we have at least, at least one retiree, uh, a cycle that publishes a book. All right. So we got some good questions popping up here. Um, wait, there it is. Uh, Dell's how, asking, how would you work with writers abroad? Great question. Cause I know that there are several that well, many have, <laughs> that have published with you guys. We actually, yeah, we actually, we're looking to get our seventh continent. We actually have worked with writers on six continents um, because we do everything like this online. Um, so everybody's reachable. Your DE may be anywhere, but that also means you can be anywhere. We actually were working with several authors right now who are uh, tiny house dwellers. Uh, we are working with several van lifers on their book. Uh, and that means every time they pop up, they're at a different Starbucks, they're at a different Walmart, they're at a different campground. We got no idea. Like we had one guy that was in Canada and in his call in the next week, he was in Mexico. Whatever, you know, that's, it doesn't matter where you are now. It's really leveraging the technology that we have so that we can be anywhere. And that's the beauty of it is how we work with, with writers abroad doesn't change at all. We work with everybody the exact same way. Sessions with the professor are taped and they're recorded and you can access those on our platform at any time. So it doesn't matter if the session isn't convenient for you, you can watch it later. You can come back to it later. You can go over it with your DE. Your DE will call and you will talk to your DE at a time that's convenient for both of you. So you can work out whatever time scale shifts in time that you have. So that's really not that big a deal. It's really leveraging the technology in front of us. Yeah, because I, I have six students this uh, this round and uh, I mean, we we talk weekly uh, minus the one who's been sick, <laughs> you know, uh, but like I have weekly calls with them and, you know, sometimes and, and then it's messaging in between. So, you know, the the, the DEs in there are I mean, they're a great bunch. I mean, I, I don't think there's a single DE in there that I have that I've met that I haven't enjoyed working with or talking to. Um, we're just a crazy bunch of people <laughs> talk, nerding out about books all day long, which is pretty fantastic. Yeah, we all have the same goals and that is to see our students succeed and publish their book in the best way possible. Yeah, uh, so Linda, uh, I see you, thanks for the clarification. I have a few questions, fabulous. Uh, one, when is the best time for me as a writer to contract I don't know whether it's contact. supposed to be contact or contract <laughs> yeah. uh, new degree uh, currently revising a novel. Let's deal with that one first. Okay. So the best time to, to contact us, actually you can contact us at any time, whether you're revising, whether you're starting your novel, uh, because the truth is it actually kind of feeds into your second question. Um, wouldn't we reject inquiries or manuscripts are not fit for publishing? Well, here's the thing because of the type of publisher we are, there's going to be very little that we actually flatly reject. Now, we may not go in and say, you're ready to publish. And that's what a lot of authors want to hear. What we may say is that you need to work with a DE. So we're going to send you back through the whole program so that you work with a DE to get your book up to where it needs to be. Then you'll get feedback from your acquisitions editor. Then you'll head into publishing and do a full set of revisions based on the feedback. Um, it's very rare for us to out and out reject somebody without offering them 
another way to get their book published, whether it's to come back and actually in the next cycle, let's work with a DE. You've got something here with a lot of potential, but we need to get it up to a publishable quality. Um, if we reject something outright, um, first of all, we really don't believe in a not fit for publishing because we teach people how to write books that are published. So what we're gonna suggest is that you learn from us how to write your book so that it's up to a publishing standard. Um, what we would be looking at is, is it a type of book that we don't want to publish? So if it's erotica, then we would reject it and say, you know, we, this needs to go to a publisher that specializes in erotica or what you're looking to publish. That's not something that we ask our DEs to work with. And so it would be more based on subject matter than it would be the quality necessarily of the manuscript. Now, don't get me wrong. If you send us chicken scratchings on paper, we're probably gonna send it back and say, hey, um, could you at least type it so we could? <laughs> um, but we're definitely, I mean, if there's clearly not been any effort put into it. We're definitely gonna say, you're gonna have to go through the program and go from day one with the DE. Um, but for those that come through, um, you know, people do submit books to me directly. Um, and books that come through that way, there are some that I say, this can go to AE and get its first round of feedback and then move on into revisions and start a publishing cycle in the next publishing cycle. We have three publishing cycles a year. Um, and I do also have others where I go back and I go, this thing's all tell no show, or there's another substantive problem with the book where they've got an incredible base, but we need to build out that base so they have an incredible book. We're gonna send you back to work with a DE so they can point out where you need depth, where you need details, where you need missing citations, which is huge with nonfiction books, just missing citations all over the place. Just here's, they say, we have to know who they is. You're gonna to have to name someone, you're gonna to have to use a quote. Um, and in fiction, it is show versus tell is the one that will get you. We're going to send you back to work with a specialized fiction DE to teach you the difference. So when you get up to a publishing, you're ready to publish, you're publishing the novel you want to publish, not just the notes on the action points in your novel, because you just told us about the book rather than wrote the book. So I hope that helps both of those because they do actually feed together. Um, yeah. And yeah. we don't take just inquiry in, inquiries, right? So if you go to Creator Institute and you look, you're, we're really about like you are looking at us, right? So you're going to jump in and maybe attend a session. You're going to do a few things. You're going to answer some questions. You're going to meet Professor Coaster. You're going to do some other things that lead into writing your book because our goal is to see you published. Um, like I said, we're not really big on the, the phrase not fit for publishing uh, because that's what we're here to do is to teach you how to be ready to publish. Yeah. And um, along that line, I think it'd be good to mention here what genres you will and will not accept. Okay. The big will not is erotica. Um, and we're not real big on romance either. Um, we we'll look at literary fiction. We definitely look at poetry. Um, we look at almost anything nonfiction. Um, there may be some, now if there's a legal issue, um, we would definitely have to think about that. I know that we've had writers approach us uh, regarding ongoing cases when we knew that we couldn't have somebody writing a book about an ongoing case from the person who's in the case. We, we couldn't do that at that right. time. Um, you just can't. Um, but we have had people write on everything from spirituality to uh, right now we we do accept, um, we do talk to horror authors. We actually have, uh, like I said earlier, we actually have a, a well-known horror author who is one of our DEs that works with horror author, authors specifically. Uh, Stephen does a lot of work with our sci-fi and fantasy authors. Uh, we have poetry DEs specifically. We have nonfiction DEs specifically. We actually have several reporters that do uh, investigative journalism um, and work on those nonfiction books specifically. So we're actually pretty open, um, but we, we are gonna reject anything that's gonna have a legal issue. 
Um, and we will reject any, like I said, erotica or romance, because those are really not things that we're interested in or publishing right now. Sure. Makes sense. Uh, so to, and I know that I want to be respectful of your time. So we'll probably just take a couple more questions here. Um, <clears throat> cause my streams tend to last anywhere from, you know, an hour to three. So <laughs> to, to be respectful well, of Shannon's I'll time, more time but I'll, I'll let you know when I'm like, <laughs> um so linda's third question is do you distribute the books and push sales in the retail is it included in the service or is it entirely the writer's responsibility in that first wave of books we distribute and then after that it becomes the writer's responsibility you retain the rights so it is up to you if you want to do a book tour there's no reason that when you're working with your marketing editor they can't help you put together your book tour. Now you will be responsible for doing those things. You're going to have to, you want to go to all the, let's say you live in Seattle, right? Or Portland, Portland's even better. You want to write it. You want to have a signing at Powell's. You want to trot right down there and drop right in the middle of Powell's first floor and have a big old signing. You need to talk to the manager at Powell's. And it's important that you do it, first of all, because you're getting out in front of the people who are going to be selling your book for you. You need to make those contacts with your with those managers. You need to be talking to them. But you can also be talking to your marketing editor about how do I put together a, basically, a letter that I email out to all of these different managers when I get their names to say, I want to do a book tour and come stop at your store and then you work with them on ordering the number of books that they need and putting that together. So being a hybrid, there's going to be some hybrid work. We're going to help you with the first push. And then after that, it is up to you. Now, distribution is a little different. Distribution is going to be handled through the distributor itself, right? That's going to be through the printer. So whether it's Ingram Spark or KDP, they're going to handle that for you based on the orders they receive back. You're even we aren't going to be that involved with that, right? Because once you've published or printed the book and chosen that distribution network, that's the network you're going to have. Even once we kind of step away and go, congratulations, you're out there doing it. You have your book, you've had your creation event. And now what is your next step? And that's kind of up to you. I like that. I think that's cool. The, um, and great, great question, Linda, because, uh, I know that for, for some, um, uh, so I have a friend who is traditionally published. She had her book up on Wattpad, moved it, found a traditional publisher, got all that done. And she had to pay for the, um, author's copies in like for the first like hundred books or whatever, in order to kind of sell them at those kinds of events. Is that something similar with, NDP where they, the, do you guys essentially pay for the books for them to use for their event or do they pay for it themselves? There are a certain number of copies for the first go round. And I'm not sure because I'm not on the publishing side. I'm on the creator side. Gotcha. Um, I'm not sure of exactly how many that is. Um, but there are a certain number of copies that you do get when you publish. Okay. Use however you choose. Makes sense. Um, and those are beyond the pre-sale copies. So that's completely up to you, however you use those copies. Um, I would suggest that you use them for signings and events like that to kind of kickstart you. Sure. Um, because as a self-published author at that point, once you've had those first few events, once you've run through those copies, you will, like any self-published author, need to order your copies. Now, you'll buy them at the discount author's rate. And then you sell them for the cover price, just like you would anywhere else. But the key is, and the thing that would really work for you is if you are doing a book tour, is you get the managers to order the copies for your event. Then you don't have to haul them in your car from event to event or onto the <laughs> with you from event to event. Um, and then when, you know, if the event goes well, then all the copies sell out and great. And if they don't, then they can remainder them back to the distributor who will redistribute them on the next order. Cool. Makes sense. Uh, Don's got a question. Uh, what if you want to work with a DE right away? Is that possible? 
Well, what you would do in that case is that uh, in the next cycle, which starts, I believe, in June, is that you would sign up for uh, Creator Institute's next summer, our summer cycle uh, in June. And your DE, you would have your first couple of sessions with uh, Professor Coaster and you would start working with your DE at that point. If you're looking to work with a DE tomorrow, um, I would actually go out to Reedsy. I would contact Stephen, um, you know, and whether you're interested in working with Stephen or with me or with somebody else, uh, we can find somebody that will work with you privately today, tomorrow. That's not going to be an issue. Um, but to do it through NDP, we do have to do it in cycles because we do have so many students. And the next cycle starts in June. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> then Dal is... I know this, it's not out of place. This is why we have this Dal. It's okay. Um, how can, how can I, if, if basically like, if they want to work with you, how do they do it? Okay. So, um, for the June, for June hiring, uh, for those of you who are members of Upwork, I will be posting, um, starting in the next week. So I would be looking in the next seven to 10 days for a posting from Creator Institute NDP. It will have my name on it somewhere or should, um, but I would be looking for that on Upwork. And that is how you apply to work with us is that you'll apply there. I will contact you if you have the right qualifications that we're looking for. And uh, we'll do an interview. I wrap with somebody like this, this would be part of the interview um, and we'll see what we can do and if it will work for us. And if, you know, if it will be a great working relationship and you'll fall into the team, um, I'll bring you on because that is, that's big part of what I do is choosing which editors um, are going to work the best with uh, Creator Institute and NDP and building a really fantastic team of editors, both for the experience and sharing information between the editors, as well as people who are excited and want to work with students and teach and, and uh, really kind of help build this kind of publishing. Yeah. And then I think, I think this is where I think it finished it up works with you as a DE I assistant or anything you need where I can have that. Yeah. I think that's what you, I think that's what it was, uh, what the question was up above. Yeah. And I, like I, said, I would look in the next seven to 10 days and you should see a post uh, from Creator Institute NDP on Upwork for our next round in the summer session for the June start date. Awesome. All right, guys, any final wrap up questions that you guys can think of while we have Shanda on? If not, I'll give it a second here. Um, one of the things that I wanted to address um, a little bit, uh, we could do like a condensed version here since we have um, limited time, but what uh, I know that you guys use Indiegogo as the campaigns in order to do that. Um, what typically is like the minimum goal to help people get their books published? Uh, minimum, uh, uh, to fundraise? It will, it depends on what their goal is, right? It, your goal is going to be different. You know, your minimum is going to be different if you just want an ebook versus you want hardcovers versus you want, you want an audio book versus you want, you want world domination. These are all going to be, <laughs> well, all the know, books. <laughs> I want to be, you know, I want to be king of the world, right? You know, and hopefully not on the Titanic. So, you know, if that's what your goal is, um, all of those minimums are going to be a little bit different. And like I said, I'm not on the publishing side currently. I'm sure. on the creator side. So I don't really want to speak to dollar amounts on those minimums, but there is a minimum for each one. Um, but that's what your, it, it's always attainable. It's always very attainable. And that's what your marketing editor there is there to help you do is to help you plan and understand how easily it is to attain it. Especially when you think about if you're going out and looking at your social network and thinking, well, I need, I need a hundred pre-sales. Okay. How many friends do you have on Facebook? 680. I bet you can get a hundred pre-sales before you even go out to your LinkedIn network, which is probably a different group of people. Yeah. And then you go out to your Instagram network, which is probably a different group of people. And by the time you actually mill for all of your possible contents, you know, all of your possible con 
contacts, that is, you can probably hit your minimum presale what, for whatever goal you've chosen without as much effort as you think. I, what happens with a lot of students is they freak out, freak out, freak out is first reaction. First reaction is freak out. Uh, mm -hmm. Second reaction is say, I can't do it. Third reaction is once we've got the paper bag in front of them and they're breathing again and they're no longer blue, um, is to is to kind of stop and go, well, I do have 9,000 Twitter followers. What does that mean? That means you're going to be fine. <laughs> you, you need to pre-sell 150 books. I think you can do this. It's the pool from which we will fish. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You you can do this. It's okay. And so yeah. it's the, the whole point is to not get caught up in this numbers game with yourself is that all of the, the goals are actually fairly low. So don't, you know, if they come to you and say you need to pre-sell, you've you've gone, you you want full color, hardcover, you know, super sized books, and you you need to pre-sell 300 books to do this, and you're looking at your like I said, you're looking at your platform of, of Facebook followers and you've got 900 in there. Okay. Let's figure it out because you can do it. Yeah. Even if you only have, if you need to sell 200, and you only have 200 followers. What they're going to teach you to do is how to post on Facebook to get more followers, to get more people interested. So you build that platform so you can sell those 350 books you want to sell pre-sale. So it's all, there, there's a lot of moving pieces there, but there's nothing there that you can't do if you do the work. Sure. Uh, and, well, and you've seen, right? Like you can go out, like I said, you can go out to Amazon, just type in new degree press and look at all the books. Um, and so clearly people are doing it all the time. You know, yeah. they're not unattainable goals. They're only unattainable if, if you're that person, it's just like, yeah, I want to do it. And then you don't do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a, the diet starts Monday, <laughs> you know? But yeah. Monday never comes. Monday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we'll do this last question here. So can you work with NDP just so you can work with the teachers and it's uh, so like not to self publish, but to learn. Okay. So you could choose to do that. You could just take the course to take the course. Um, I don't think you would get as much out of it because you wouldn't be writing. Now, if you did do it and write and just say that I, I'm not going to publish, um, but still went ahead and wrote the, the 20,000 words and learned to put together a rough draft manuscript, you could absolutely do that. And we have at least one or two people per course that do that, um, that for whatever reason, they're like, I'm not going to publish. I just wanted to write a rough draft or I wanted to write my story and just get it out of me. Um, and I don't really want to publish it. I don't want anybody to see it. You can absolutely do that. Um, now you would still be working with, in that case, especially if you're writing, you're still going to be working with your DE and having those additional lessons and that additional feedback. Um, and so that that is something to keep in mind. So if you're looking to just take the class as a class, that's definitely something that you could contact Professor Custer about. But if you're looking to work with the DE and actually kind of do the work, which is where you're going to get the most out of it, um, yeah, you can definitely do that. And like I said, we have at least one or two people per per cycle three times a year that's like, no, no, I just wanted to write a book for fun or no, no, I just wanted to, to learn to write a manuscript and I'm not going to publish. I want to, I want to work on a real idea later or, or I have something else I wanted to do, or it was just for me. And we, we've had several people do that too, where they just like, no, I wanted to learn to do it for me. I just wanted to learn to do it. And that's, I don't know. I think that's awesome. So yeah, you can absolutely do that. Cool. Uh, Dal says, thank you for this interview. Very informative. And again, thank you to Shanda for, uh, agreeing to do it. Uh, Linda says, thank you for answering all my questions, Shanda. Thank you, Shanda. Thank you, Shanda. Everybody loves Shanda. This is awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. No, I, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the, the opportunity to kind of come on and, and talk books and how you can publish your book and how you can get your story out there and what's really going to work best for you. And, you know, even if I am both the writing and trying to save vanity presses for very different reasons, um, hopefully everybody understood what was going on there. Um, but if you do have any questions, uh, do definitely feel free. Um, I'm going to volunteer you on this, Stephen, you know, reach out to Stephen. He 
we're in contact like I don't know, like six days a week or something ridiculous. So, yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> always, so even if you don't have my uh, a direct way to contact me or to contact me through Creator Institute, you can contact me through Stephen uh, and feel free to ask any questions that you might uh, have that come later because that always happens. Always yeah, happens. Uh, absolutely. And and I enjoy answering those questions. Uh, again, I've. I've watched, this is a process that I'm hoping to myself go through uh, in come June-ish time. I, you know, I'm partway through my own book and wanting to submit and go through this because I've watched my students that I've worked with be successful at it. And so, you know, want to want to do that, that same kind of thing. So yeah, super excited. Um, to, to have you on and uh, thank you everybody for sticking around, watching and asking some great questions. Um, absolutely fantastic questions. And uh, like Shanda said, if you have any additional ones, you can always reach out to me. Uh, the easiest place is either going to be through my website or on Twitter. <laughs> Those are the two places that I, I tend to, to lurk most often. <laughs> And if you guys want some additional uh, information about New Degree, like I said before, their link is actually down below in the show notes. It'll take you to their website. All of the information that you could possibly hope and desire uh, <laughs> is going to be there. And you can get in contact with them uh, there as well. So uh, thank you guys so much. And I will see you, you guys next time. And again, thank you, Shanda, for joining. Thank you very much for having me. It was great. All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.